So now that you've had a little bit of practice with solubility and understanding what KSP is, we're going to look at the common ion effect and try to make some decisions here. Okay. So. Yeah, you have the, you should have this sheet. It's coming up. Yes, it's that. Mm -hmm. We just didn't finish it. I want you to go to the common ion effect part. And we're going to look at example number three, where it says solubility in the common ion effect. Okay. We have... get a better marker. I think I had AG2CRO4, 2AG plus plus CRO4 2 minus. Now, hopefully you remember that we don't write our solids in our equilibrium expressions. Okay. And so if I were just to do a regular um rice chart okay and i have a molar solubility of well hold on it tells us that the molar solubility of silver chromate is 1.3 times 10 to the negative fourth molar okay in water that would be just water calculate the molar solubility of silver chromate in a 0 0.100 molar solution of silver nitrate okay so what I need you guys to understand is, is if this were actually um, silver chromate in water, it would be one of these numbers. We would say this is zero, this is zero, this is plus two X, this is X, this is two X, this is X, right? And then we would actually say our KSP is equal to our AG plus squared times our CRO42 minus to the first, right? And then we would basically say that this is 2x squared times x, and that would be equivalent to 9.0 times 10 to the negative 12. Okay, so then we end up with 4x cubed is equal to that value. And then you would basically divide by 4, and then you would do the cubic root of to find x. They're saying that when you do all of that math, the x value ends up being 1.3 times 10 to the negative fourth molar. Okay, so they gave that to us. Okay, and so you could do the work if you wanted to do the work because you know how to do the work. But the thing is, is that they told us this part of it. Now we're changing the question a little bit because we're saying, you know what, we're not putting it in water, like all the way straight up water. We're actually putting it into a solution that may contain the water. How is it going to be affected? Okay. And so what's happening is you're going to end up having what we call a common ion because it says that our solution that we're sticking it into is silver nitrate. Well, what do we know about silver nitrate? Yeah, you're going to be putting pretty much AG plus ions and NO3 minus ions into the water, right? Okay, but here's the thing. There's a common ion which means that our starting point is not going to be at zero like you're making it. You already have some that's present and we need to figure out how it's going to change our results. Understand? So then we're going to basically, we're going to clean this up now and we're going to redo it. But this time we're going to have the 0 0.100 molar for the AG plus already populated. Okay, and then this is going to be zero because we don't have any of that. That's not a common ion. We would say this is plus X. This would be plus 2X. So this would be 0 0.100 plus 2X, and this would be X at equilibrium because it's R-I-C-E, right? Okay, and so what you're going to ultimately have is you have a KSP value that is associated with this thing, the KSP value is 9.0 times 10 to the negative 12, okay? But we're going to actually write 2, oops, AG plus squared, CRO42 minus, then we're going to say that this is 0.100 plus 2x 
squared. And this is going to be x, which is equal to 9.0 times 10 to the negative 12. Are y'all with me up to that point? Okay. Well, here's the thing. This value is really, 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 really small. So if this value is really, 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 really small, again, we could say that this is negligible. So it doesn't matter if it's being multiplied times. You don't want this to end up ultimately being a bigger number. So with us actually saying that that is negligible, I'm basically saying that this is 0 0.100 squared times X, and then I'm going to isolate X. Okay. X ends up being 9.0 times 10 to the negative 10. Oh. So do you understand what I did as far as substitutions and how I solved for X? Okay. So I'm neglecting this X because I'm saying that it can't be that big of a value. Okay. And I'm isolating this X because I'm basically saying that I can find that X value due to there not being that big of a change. And then I get this X value and oh my gosh, it's really not that big. Like it's very small number. Are you with me? Now, aha moment, aha moment. I hope you pick it up. If you add ag plus which is on the product side you should end up having a shift to the if you have an increase in what's on the product side it's going to cause a shift to the left if it's causing a shift to the left that means you're forming more solid if you're causing a shift to the left and you're forming more of a precipitate, then that must mean that your degree of solubility is going to be extremely small compared to what its solubility originally was, which was 1.3 times 10 to the negative fourth. Do you understand? So it's consistent with what you've learned about Le Chatelier's principle. Okay. Okay. The other one that's on there has the, the work for you. It's written there for you. It's just another practice for you. Are there any questions about the common ion effect? You have the common ion effect thing going on with your acids and bases. So this is not going to be your last time seeing it. Okay. Yes. Because I'm basically saying that this number can't be that big of a number. So in order for me to populate or in order for me to isolate X and solve, I'm saying that I can shortcut here. Now, could I actually solve with the two X there? Yeah, I can. But the thing is, is that if you want to minimize the amount of work that you have to do, and you can understand that with that value being super small, that this has this X value has to be negligible. It'll save you time. OK, so but you can solve. And most of the times when you have questions that are like this, you get to use a calculator on. And some of you guys are so calculator savvy. You're just like, why are we neglecting X? I totally get it. OK, then there are people like me <laughs> where I'm like, ah, neglect the X. Are we good? OK. So now we're done with this part of it. I made you guys some precipitation conditions um, sheets because we need to actually talk about when things precipitate out, at what point will they precipitate out based off of the degree of solubility, okay? Yeah, that, that. <laughs> Is that a good point? Exactly. <laughs> uh, more number work? More number work. Uh, so this is it. I thought you liked numbers. This is where I check out. <laughs> Seriously. 
I'm just thinking of the new age right now. <laughs> Mark Twain coined the term. Gilded it means covered in gold. Put it on the inside. Let it be. You just get the dumb. No, it's gold. DBQ's not this much. Yes, it is. I will. I'm writing one to the There's a thing. Next one. Well, ours is brown and visible. But it was supposed to be like next Friday, yeah? Just to speak, no, just speak next. He said he told us that he would be giving us 40 minutes of time to 40 minutes. Now we have an hour for the test and hour. Okay. We get 60 minutes. Okay, so precipitation conditions make us look at something called a reaction quotient in order to make our decision. Y'all, a reaction quotient. You know how we're like KP, KC, KSP, and every time we do our equilibrium expression, they all look the same. Well, Q will also look the same. But the thing is, is that when we're dealing with Q, I need you to understand that Q is basically saying, we don't know if we're at equilibrium. We're saying at any given point, we can determine based off of the concentrations that are given to us at any given point, what that constant would be. But the constant might not be associated with equilibrium being established. Did you process that? I'll say it again. I'll say it again. We have KSP, KC, KP. And when we have those, we're saying that we're using values that have pretty much been determined at equilibrium. And so we're saying that there's this constant that is associated with the equilibrium that has been established. Well, at any point within a reaction, you can determine Q. You would do the exact same setup like you would do for K, but equilibrium may not have been determined. So if you have concentration values and you have all the concentration values of the players involved, you can actually do the concentration of the products over the concentration over the reactants, but you cannot say that it's K if they haven't told you that equilibrium has been established. Understand? So you get to default to Q so that you can make comparisons. Okay. Okay. So Q is called the reaction quotient. Okay. Q is called the reaction quotient. And a lot of times you can take Q and compare it to K. I want to get you guys some practice problems, but I wasn't able to get them put on there for today because of what I already had planned for today. But I want you guys to practice the whole QK thing because it's really, really easy. If Q is less than K, there will be a shift to the right. If Q is greater than K, there will be a shift to the left. If Q is equal to K, you're at equilibrium. So you can actually use your Q value and compare it to K and then say, oh, wait, I'm at equilibrium if the values are the same. OK, so I'm going to make you guys practice that, but we don't have I don't have the practice for that part. Yes. So if Q is less than K on like a number line, like let's say that this is 3.2 and this is 4.5. If you determine your values and you realize that the Q value is less than the K value, in order to establish equilibrium, there would have to be a shift to the right. On a number line, let's say that the Q value here is like 5.4 and the K value is like 2.2. Well, because the Q value is higher than K, there would have to be a shift to the left in order to reach equilibrium. So the reaction would have to shift to the left. 
to establish equilibrium. How are y'all? I'm going to make you guys practice that because it's actually pretty easy. You just have to take the time to write your Q value, determine your K value, and then compare. And then when you compare, you're like, okay, well, this number is less than this number, so there's going to be a shift to the right. Or this number is greater than this number, so there's going to be a shift to the right or whatever. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I used to have pre-AP kids do the little teeter-totter thing when they were thinking about Le Chatelier's principle. <laughs> so people would be taking their test and they're like, Okay, um, I like to use the pen too. Like if it's like that, then that means you're gonna, okay. I tutored somebody yesterday and when I tutored, um, they're not in, the, in this district, but when I tutored them, they were like, I'm having a hard time with which way it goes. And I'm like, okay, well swipe, which way? And it's like, would you swipe left? Or would you swipe right in order to get it to level back out again? Swipe left, swipe right. <laughs> and it actually worked for him. He was like, ah, I got it. <laughs> okay, so if you like that. Okay, so let's take a look at whether a precipitate will form or not. Now here, on the very first page, it says that Q has to be greater than K in order for a precipitate to form. Well, why is that? Because it's going to cause a shift to the left if Q is greater than K, okay? It's going to cause a shift to the left, and that shift to the left will make it more product, I mean, reactant favored, and that's how you're going to get your solid to precipitate out, okay? So we're going to look at our values, okay? Now, example number one says, a solution is prepared by adding 750 milliliters of this concentrated, this concentrated solution to 300 milliliters of that concentrated solution. And then it's asking, will the CEIO33 precipitate? And then it gives us the KSP value for it, okay? So given the information that's been provided, doesn't this look ion concentration-y? You remember when you did your ion concentrations, this looks like I'm probably gonna have to figure out what the moles are and I'm gonna have to divide by what the liters are, okay? So let's go ahead and set this up. I'm gonna do I'm gonna do the first one with you guys, and then I'm gonna let you guys try to do the second one on your own. Okay. So I need my math already done. Let me see my I didn't want to calculate. <laughs> okay, so we have C E. NO33, and then we have it going with KIO3, which means that we would form, so of course this would have to go with that, and this would have to go with that, okay? So we would form CEIO33 and KNO3. And that's supposed to be our solid that's going to precipitate out. Okay. Spectator ions, y'all. Do you have any? Yeah, potassium's a spectator ion and nitrate's a spectator ion. So since potassium and nitrate are spectator ions, then the actual net ionic reaction would be Ce3 plus plus IO3 minus yields um, CEIO33 solid. Then they gave us values. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use those values so that I can actually get to the concentrations of the ions that are going to be present there. Okay. So we're going to take it says 750 milliliters. Okay. Yes. Yes. Did I not balance it? Let's balance it. 
I need a three here. That works. And then, I mean, I guess I could actually put it here and here, but it doesn't matter. Okay. Yep, it's good. Okay. So I'm going to take the 0 0.750 liters. And I'm going to take the concentration that's given to me for the CENO33. And they said that it was a 4.00 times 10 to the negative third moles per one liter for the CENO33. Okay. Okay. And then we are going to go from the moles of the CENO33 to the moles of the CE3 plus based off of the fact that we know that this is going this way because we're trying to find out the level of solubility. We're trying to find out the degree of solubility. Okay. So I'm going to go to the moles of the CE3 plus, which is going to give me 0 0.0030 moles. of the CE3 plus for every 1.050 liters because I'm going to have the total liters at the end of the day. Okay. Now I'm going to do the 0 0.300 liters of the KIO3 and we're going to use that concentration for the KIO3, which is 2.00 times 10 to the negative second for every one mole. I mean, for every one liter. So moles of KIO3. But then I'm going to extract the part that I care about, which is this part. So I'm going to say for every one mole of the KIO3, there's one mole. of the IO3 minus. So you see, I really haven't used my, no baby, there are not three, because we're saying in one of these, there's one of those, okay? I knew exactly where you went with that, okay? So we haven't actually used this equation yet, okay? But the thing is, is that we are gonna end up using it in a little bit to write our K expression, our equilibrium expression, okay? But what's weird is that we wrote this reaction, but we're trying to find the degree of solubility for this guy. So since we're trying to find the degree of solubility for this, and we're trying to write our equilibrium expression, it's kind of like this is flipped. Like it would be better for me to write this over here, because if I wrote it over here, it's similar to what we've been practicing with. Do you understand what I'm saying? because we're actually trying to write an equilibrium expression. So I would say KSP is equal to, and we're trying to say that there's a certain degree of solubility associated with the KSP value, right? So we're talking about the, how soluble this thing is, this precipitate is, okay? So I just rearranged it to help me with processing. And then if I actually wrote my equilibrium expression, I would say that this is CE3 plus, and this would be IO3 minus, but there's your cubed right there, James. Okay, because when I write my equilibrium expression, it should look like that, right? And I would take that coefficient there and I would make it an exponent, okay? Okay, but let me go ahead and finish this part right here. I end up with um, 0 0.006 moles of IO3 minus, for every 1.050 liters, because you have to add the two together, right? In order to say, this is the concentration of that, this is the concentration of that, okay? So the concentrations that I get are, let's see, one of them is, check my math, please, 0 0.00286 molar. Did you get that for this one? 
So 0 0.0030 divided by 1.050. So 0 0.00286? Okay, perfect. And then 0 0.006 divided by 1.050, did you get 0 0.0057? Okay. Now, here's the thing, you guys. I'm going to write my expression, but instead of saying KSP, I'm going to say Q because they're saying that this is the starting point. You're adding these things together and we don't know if equilibrium has been established. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say Q is equal to CE3 plus times IO3 minus cubed. And I'm going to populate the IO3 minus concentration there. And I'm gonna populate the CE3 plus concentration there to solve for what Q is, is specifically, because I cannot say that this is equilibrium because they didn't say that equilibrium had been established, okay? So then when you go and solve, you should have ended up with pretty much Q is equal to 5.29 times 10 to the negative 10. You with me? Okay, but the thing is, is that they told us what K was. They said that K is 1.9 times 10 to the negative 10th. If K is 1.9 times 10 to the negative 10th, and Q is 5.29 times 10 to the negative 10th, will it precipitate? Is Q bigger than K or is K bigger than Q? Q is bigger than K, so it will precipitate a lot of work, huh? Are there any questions? My gosh, that's a lot of work. That's overwhelming. Okay, so see if you can organize it for the second question and determine whether it's going to precipitate or not.
anybody else have beautiful handwriting that they can share with us too? <laughs> And for questions like these, I like the example. I definitely agree your work because it would be a 50 50 shot of it. Yeah. Nope. Oh yeah, I know. I, I have my slang work up here. I don't really I don't ever really fully do it. I know. Even though I don't like, like during my yeah, test, he's talking about practice. Because you're dealing with concentration, I would just try to get used to doing parentheses. I mean, brackets, because I feel like they could determine, they could 
that could be something that they discuss in the room. Like, are we going to accept this or are we not going to accept this? And you don't want your paper to be one of those that's part of the discussion. Yeah. <laughs> if we Okay, so then the very last part for our focus today is Okay. So our very last focus for today is for you to determine which might precipitate first. Now that you know that you're looking for Q to be greater than K, okay, um, could you actually make a decision about whether something is going to precipitate before something else is going to precipitate if you know that both have the ability to precipitate? Did you pick up on that? For example, so on this sheet that you have, the last page, you guys understand your solubility rules and <laughs> the majority of them you have under control. I know you guys have nitrate under control because we've been dealing with nitrate so many times. But let's say that we have... Hmm, if we have a container that has copper two plus and AG plus ions in it, okay? So we have a certain concentration of our Cu two plus, we have a certain concentration of our AG plus, okay? And let's say that we decide to pour salt crystals in there. When we pour the salt crystals in there, you guys are supposed to understand that the NaCl is going to break apart into, because it's, it's a, that's in solution, Na plus and Cl minus ions, right? So the question then becomes, what's going to actually be formed as a result of us pouring the NaCl into the beaker? Okay, well, we know that halides are soluble, except when with, very good, silver, lead, or mercury. And so when I go and I place NaCl in there, I can identify easily that I'm basically going to be making a precipitate that is going to be silver chloride. Okay, so AgCl will be my precipitate. But... What if that weren't copper? What if that were lead? If I have PB2 plus ions and I have AG plus ions, I would expect for me to have AGCL and PBCL2, okay, if it's lead 2, okay, that is going to precipitate out. The question then turns into which one would precipitate first? And the reason why is what if I want to extract one of them and not the other one? At what point could I potentially do that? Are you processing what I'm saying to you? Which means that I could still get one of them to precipitate out first, collect that guy before I actually go and get the other one to precipitate and collect that guy. Okay. So what you would do is with the information that you have provided, we want to go ahead and write our Q values based off of those reactions. So we have two reactions. We have Ag plus Cl, Ag plus plus Cl minus reversible yield AgCl. And then we have Pb2 plus plus 2Cl minus reversible yield PbCl2. If you are writing a K expression, your K expression would have the Ag plus and the Cl minus in it because you're trying to see what the solubility would be associated with that solid. How are you? We still good? So what I want you to do is I want you to go ahead and write your K expressions. Write the K expression for this one. Write the K expression for this one. 
knowing that those particular solids have the ability to form those ions. You don't have it. So you're writing just the expression right now. And then we're going to talk about how we're going to use this to our advantage. Okay, so we know it's about the Cl minus that's being added as to how we're going to get our precipitate to form, right? Well, if I say, you know what, instead of me finding K, I want to find Q, you can use numbers at any given point, right? They gave us numbers. They said the solution contains 1.0 times 10 to the negative second molar of the Ag plus. And it said 2.0 times 10 to the negative second molar of the PB2 plus. We have not established equilibrium, but we do have an equilibrium constant. Well, remember, if Q is greater than K, it's going to precipitate. So why don't we just go ahead and use our Q. Let's populate what we have for our AG plus. Let's make this our question mark. And we're going to set it equal to the 1.8 times 10 to the negative 10. But we know that when we find this, that's going to be the starting point. When you find what X is here, you'll know that you have to have at least this much CL minus in order to get it to precipitate out. Do you understand? Because Q has to be greater than K. Understand? So then let's go ahead and populate. So I'm like, okay, this is 1.0 times 10 to the negative second molar, okay? And to find my CL minus here, I'm basically just going to divide that over. And so I'll end up with 1.8 times 10 to the negative eighth molar okay so we're just dividing this to the other side okay and then you end up getting this answer now we're going to do the other one and then we'll compare so for our other one q is equal to 2.0 times 10 to the negative second. And this would be our CL minus, which is like our X value. And it's squared. So don't forget about that. And it's going to be equal to the 1.7 times 10 to the negative fifth. We end up isolating X. And it ends up being 2.9 times 10 to the negative second molar so in order to make the precipitate you have to have at least this much cl minus added to it in order to make this precipitate you have to have at least this much cl minus added to it 
which substance will precipitate first? Yeah, AGCL will precipitate first. Okay, and then once you finally get to 2.9 times 10 to the negative second, then you'll eventually be able to precipitate out the PBCL2. And that's your lesson for today. Yes. So if you add like one molar yeah, to like this whole thing, right? Mm -hmm. Will that molar amount get reduced before it like, oh no, that's not enough. Well, no, so you keep pouring it, right? It actually reaches the point where it's 1.8 E negative 8, correct? Okay. Like it'll eventually reach the point where it can precipitate AG. Right. So if you can continue pouring it, will that... You'll start, you'll start getting this yeah. as your precipitate. Will that concentration decrease slightly every time you add to it, though? Does it keep reacting with the AD? With the concentration of the CL minus? <laughs> okay, just think through it, and if yeah. you know what you're asking, like... <laughs> okay. Okay, so you guys, you got finished with, like, 15 minutes, huh? I kind of feel like you should practice Q. You want me to find a Q paper for you? <laughs> have, I, have I put you through too much? Yeah, babe. Hold on, hold on one second. You know what I can, what I think you should do? I think you should go back to that equilibrium number one paper and see if you can add answer more things on it now. Remember that equilibrium one paper where I had you guys do number one and number two, A, B, C, D? I want you to go back to that and see if you can actually answer some more of those questions now that we've had quite a bit of discussion.